Hi, uh, welcome to Telugu and our Facebook uh, weekly webinar. Uh, uh, this is a. Uh, it is uh, associated with the Burgos and uh, Garrison law firm to bring all uh, simplified information to everyone. We are planned to do every week uh, Wednesday Central Time, 6 p.m. So uh, thanks, thanks to the Lucas uh, Garrison. So we know, you know, you know, we are doing last couple of weeks to on um, uh, immigration topics. Uh, last uh, last two weeks, we are uh, we are discussing about uh, the green card numbers. Uh, maybe yesterday we we got a, about a good news, but unfortunately we did not get the visa bulletin. So we don't we don't know uh, when the USA has released the visa bulletin. We anticipating maybe next couple of days or by end of the week. So. Everyone was disappointed based on yesterday. USCS did not uh, release the visa bulletin. The everyone are ready to know what is the priority date, how much far to uh, maybe one year, two year, or three years, or maybe current some some uh, some cases. So today here uh, we have a Lucas uh, Garrison to give the more information about the 485 applic adjustment uh, status and of, uh, related to the documentation and forms and uh, fees. The welcome, Lucas. Welcome to the weekly webinar, Facebook webinar. Welcome Hi, to Vinkat. the show. Hi, Vinkat. Thank you so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be back. And uh, hopefully we have some good interaction with our uh, audience today. So I think it's a very good topic for us to start with as far as uh, what documents might be required and uh, what to be prepared for if you can file your uh, application for adjustment of status. Yeah, thank you. The first thing it meant, uh, actually we disappointed uh, yesterday, it meant, so we thought the USCIS, it meant it was re released, uh, it meant so it's going to be released, uh, the visa bulletin, even we waited for the last end of the day, we didn't see, is there any reason to did not release the visa October visa bulletin. Do you have information you can share to us? I don't have any information per se. I would imagine that there's still some um, maybe administrative work being done, preparing actual numbers, getting everything correctly uh, processed for the new fiscal year. Uh, the maybe another. Reason might be we're closer to our first, uh, you know, presidential uh, debate. Maybe there's something in line with what the president wants to include as far as uh, his, you know, disclosing maybe a new plan for merit-based immigration or something of the of that, uh, you know, following, you know, so something that would come out similar or close to whenever that event takes place next week. So hopefully we get it, you know, tomorrow. Uh, it, it is a little bit late and it's, you know, has everyone both excited and nervous at the same time. Yeah, exactly. It means most of, uh, most, I'm very excited to know the, how far to move the date because uh, they, everyone know the green card is a very long waiting the process. So this is really good news to everyone, uh, green card holders. I mean, so if you get current uh, everyone will happy so so as we are saying fast couple of weeks it means so uh, be ready with your events uh, information 485 uh, adjustment status information and the documentations maybe they maybe connect to the your attorney and uh, get to know what is the present status and uh, what documents required it means we keep saying last couple of weeks so the today we are going to discuss uh, only topic on 485 adjustment status. Uh, Lucas, can you give the the entire structure? It means if anyone want to apply the 485 adjustment, can you give the steps? The what are included? Yes. So, very good point to start off the show. Uh, we, you know, whenever you file 
an adjustment of status application, it's very important, uh, especially if it's based upon an I-140. We want to make sure that you're still employed with the same employer that filed the I-140 petition so that they can support, uh, you know, and hopefully that your role uh, or job hasn't changed uh, too much to where a new I-140 would be required. Uh, and what you would want to do is file along with the approval notice of the I-140, you'd want to file your I-485, which is primarily going to have all the information similar to what you would fill out in a, uh, a DS uh, before you go, f you know, for a non-immigrant visa appointment. Uh, they're going to want to know, you know, your biometrics, your background, where you've lived, if you've committed any types of crimes, if you violated any non-immigrant status, um, if you're a terrorist, a communist, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and this form is going to collect all that data. You'll want to be very careful to review this data and make sure Lucas, it's correct. Maybe, maybe I'm stopping here, just uh, stepping back, once to back. Uh, I think, uh, uh, so, uh, we have the five different forms to apply, fill, the, fill for the adjustment to 485. Right. The first is I-485. The next form is I-765. The another one is I-131. The, the second, another one is I-944. The last one is I-64. We can go for the each form uh, so that everyone get to know uh, about the form. It means we don't want to clump all information into the, the one form so that we can separate and discuss so that everyone get to uh, aware of each form, uh, the information, what needs to be taken taken for the applications. The first, we go for the 485. You're already explaining. Maybe you can continue on that one. Then once completed, we can go for the I-765. Sure. I'll, I'll kind of keep it a little bit more basic. Um, the, the first form, like we discussed, is the 485. It's going to be your primary form for the adjustment of status. Uh, you would also have the option to file uh, I-765, which is going to be for your employment authorization uh, or your EAD. You can also file uh, your I-131, which would be for advanced parole, which allows you to uh, depart the country and return. Uh, and then you would also want to complete the I-944. This is a new form. Uh, this is basically going to encompass the public charge rule. So it's going to document and establish, you know, whether or not you're a public charge, if you use public benefits, uh, things like that. And then if you have a derivative, uh, derivative means you have a spouse or a child or children that you also want to file for. You would also need for them, each person's going to have to complete their own packet with their own information and filing fees. And for spouses and children, you're also going to need to have like a, a, your just your uh, affidavit of support, showing that you know you meet the criteria, uh, you pr you pass the means test to show that your household you know uh, you know can uh, provide. Uh, so there's no public charge or public burden uh, on those uh, other members of your household. <coughs> okay, Lucas. I have a question on uh, I-75. This this form is uh, apply for the employment authorization card. Let's say in a family, the wife and husband and one kid, maybe 10 years old kid. So let's say is a wife and husband uh, is a the good chance to apply the EAD so that they can work any they can work they can utilize the authorization card. The whatever the kid 10 years kid it means so uh, we are also need to apply for the EAD for 10 years old, or what is the uh, information on this one? That's a very good question. Um, again, you know, we have a new, uh, as we're waiting for the new visa bill to, to come out, we also have new rules, new fees, new filing requirements uh, after October 2nd. So in the past, you would file your adjustment of status, your I-485 with the I-765 and I-131, and it would be one fee. So it was all included. You would just want to file because it's all included, and there's no reason really not to. Now we're going to have to file 
additional fees when it comes to employment authorization and advanced parole. Um, so the, the cost is going to be a little bit more depending whether or not you want to, you know, file for employment authorization or, or an advanced parole document. Um, you know, these are all things to consider moving forward now that, you know, the cost uh, is pretty significant for each 765, the employment authorization is $550. Um, and then for the I-131 is $590 and the biometrics, uh, fee has gone down where it's $30 now from 85. So it's still a significant cost, um, especially for a minor who, you know, there's no benefit really, uh, for them to go work. So, so this fee is only on minor and the kids are below, uh, below it means uh, 10 years and, uh, Kate, you are you are you are giving me all information about this uh, the minor applicant. Correct. So I mean, with the extra expenses, it's probably not a good idea to you know pay for to have your your kid have employment authorization because you know it's an additional cost now. In the past, if, even up today, like if we file a case today, I would recommend just doing it for everyone because it's all included in one price. The price would be $1,225 uh, to file for adjustment, and you just file all the forms together. Um, yeah, but now in the future, the, you know, with the expenses going up, you know, that's, it's kind of uh, something each family is probably going to have to decide what they want to do. Uh, but you know, probably for the adults in the family, mom and dad, uh, you know, you'd want to have um, probably EAD and advanced parole for both. Uh, just so there's no issues moving forward. Okay. So uh, recently, it meant, so I say the USCS, uh, given the RFEs, who did not sub submit it while apply the 485 adjustment, it meant, so I-994, who did not submit the I-94, all or got the RFEs. Now, why this uh, USCS uh, giving the RF recently, uh, is any uh, policy changed or is any and, and terms and conditions got changed? Yes, uh, terms and conditions have changed. And matter of fact, this last year, you know, there's been drastic changes. In the past, if you file for these uh, immigrant uh, benefits, if you didn't complete the petition correctly or if something was incorrectly, you know, uh, included, or maybe there was this minor mistake, you would have the opportunity through an RFE to address that mistake and correct it. Now, if all the proper evidence is not submitted with the application, if there's an omission or something else, USCIS uh, has two choices. They can either reject the application or they can take the filing fees and then deny the application. So it's very important to consult with an immigration attorney or at least to make sure everything's you know, correct and complete before you file. Uh, in both scenarios, even if you receive your uh, money back and they didn't cash the filing fees, the issue would then become what if the dates regress on the ability to file for adjustment? Then you know, if it, it takes six weeks to get the package back because of a mistake, uh, you, you maybe you miss your opportunity uh, to file for your adjustment of status for EAD uh, because the you know the dates have changed. Yeah, okay. Depends. Particularly, I saw in uh, USCS so given February to 2022, October 2022, who who applied in between this 485 adjustment and did not submit the I nine I nine four four. I think they are getting the RFEs to submit this information, right? The, what is the I-944? So that's a very good question. The I-944 is a new form that addresses a concern that our president has in regards to public charge. Uh, what does this mean? Does this mean that you've re received public benefits? Are you receiving, you know, um, uh, you know housing benefits, medical benefits, food um, anything else and, it, and there's a factors that are included on this form that impact you know that the agency uses to determine if you're going to be an impact or public charge in the future um, 
in the past, when it was first implemented, uh, obviously there's a the organization I'm a part of, American Immigration Lawyers Association, along with a few other groups, had sued the uh, government to prohibit the impl- implementation of this new uh, requirement. So there was what we call an injunction granted by a court. And the injunction means everything's put on hold until the merits of the case can be decided. Uh, the government appealed this decision, and um, the Second Circuit said, no, you can go forward, the government can go forward and proceed with this uh, new requirement. And then there was another lawsuit trying to freeze it because they said because of COVID-19, there's a, a public health emergency that caused you know this. So long story short, since the 944 came out, I was always in the practice of including this with any application I filed, because I assumed, you know, if it's not required, they're not going to use it. If it something happens in the future, uh, they're going to, you know, want to know where it is. And I don't want to risk anyone losing their filing fees or having a case rejected unnecessarily. So uh, as of today, you know, it's a requirement. We need to include, if you're preparing your case, you need to include this with uh, um, your petition or application. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for the information. Our viewer segments, uh, your segments. We are Lucas is giving more information. If you have any questions, you can post in our Facebook page or comment so that uh, Lucas will give the more clarity on your question. Just uh, post your questions on Facebook page. Lucas, you are saying that uh, the I nine four four, the Trump administration is asking about the uh, the assets and the tax filing benefits. Let's say if any H1 holder buy a house, so when when H1 holder buy a house, maybe uh, after one year might get some tax benefit or something. What exactly benefit on the mo- uh, houser? If even the H1 is maybe the person uh, get the tax benefit will any issue on uh, 485 adjustment do you can you suggest uh, on this one so so that's a very good question typically on a scenario you just explain <clears throat> it's not going to be included what i what we're referring to is anything that's uh, uh cash assistant for income maintenance uh, supplemental security income uh, if you have received a, a Medicaid for any treatment of emergency medical condition, if you have uh, temporary assistance for needy families, uh, cash programs for assistance from any government, Section 8 housing, uh, SNAP, where low-income uh, households can uh, secure uh, food and, and benefits for children. Um, you have uh, public housing or any FUD federally funded Medicaid uh, programs. So all these are, you know, pretty much programs that are designed to help people who are in need. Um, And for the most part, anyone who's H-1B visa holder, I would be pretty confident to know that they wouldn't even qualify if they even tried to obtain these uh, programs. So something based on your house or, or, Anything else is not going to impact uh, the public burden. Now, um, I do want to mention, you mentioned about buying a house. So one thing you do have to disclose on these uh, new forms is you want to have all your liabilities and all your assets. So you will have to disclose your mortgage. You'll have to disclose maybe other um, payments. like You have a car payment. Uh, you do, so you want to have a list of all your assets and all your liabilities. And then you're also going to want to have a copy of your credit report. And you're going to, if you have social security number, you should have access to your credit report and you can obtain those uh, reports for free one time every year. So it's a good idea right now, whoever has the opportunity, go ahead and pull your credit report. And that's something we'll want to include uh, when we file the adjustment of status uh, application. Yeah. Thanks, so uh, Lucas. The here it means I'm going to a little bit deeper and uh, understanding the the scenarios. 
let's say is uh, maybe I, I can give you the two questions. Uh, the first one is a uh, house. Let's say the wife and husband. The husband is a uh, H1 primary and uh, the spouse. The wife is H4 EAD. Let's say they buy house and uh, got the mortgage on wife credit score. So while applying the 485, so you are saying to submit the all credit reports and mortgage. Let's say here the primary applicant doesn't have the, any mortgage uh, uh, mortgage on in credit in his credit score. How we apply it? Means so if you take the family of three, the wife, husband, wife, and kid. So we need to get all individual credit score or we need to get all individual liabilities and asset. How we can differentiate this uh, for this 485 adjustment status? Can you give more de in detail on this? That's a very good question. Uh, so when we fill out the I-944, we're going to need to have one for each person who's applying. Uh, just like you would want to have an I-45 for each person applying. Um, in the I-944, it accounts for household members. So as long as uh, you're all living a, in one house, considered one household, uh, which you probably are if you file jointly on taxes and claim uh, kids as far as you know, tax deductions, um, it, everything would just be included in that. So what we've done in the past, we include everyone who's a member of that household. So for husband, primary uh, filer who has the, H, uh, the I-140, uh, we would file, um, including both credit reports of uh, husband and wife, the same for the spouse and the same for the kid. Yeah, okay. So is there anything on forms uh, the H-1 holders or maybe Mm, green card holders who are ready to apply the 485. Is there any additional information you want to share to us? Um, well, at this point in time, I think going back to the visa bulletin, I, I just want to strongly encourage everyone to understand there's two points that we discuss and we, we, we're we trying to uh, provide information on. First is something we call a final action day. This is uh, the allotment of visas that are available, uh, which means these are the number of visas that can be issued for that priority date. Uh, that number is going to move some because of uh, we, we believe that family-based uh, unused visas are going to be issued for employment-based. And so that should move, you know, at least six months to a year. Now, we also have heard a lot of news about through the agency, through you know, we don't have an established uh, report or anything that's proven yet, but we've heard a lot of rumors saying that a lot of these uh, dates for filing adjustment of status can become current. So we don't know if that means going from 2009 all the way to 2014 or anyone who has an approved I-140 can already submit their adjustment. Now, what does this do? If you file and you uh, file your adjustment of status application, that allows you to get your EAD and advanced parole. So it allows you to have a little bit more security while you're here. And you should always maintain your H-1B status just in case something goes wrong uh, in the future with your uh, adjustment. But you might be waiting for some years for the actual green card. But let's say your project ends or something happens with the, your petitioner for your H-1. You know, if something bad happens or a case is denied... It's not like you have to make a decision, I need to sell my house, my car, move back home, or try and desperately find a new employer. So there's this is more of a security blanket that keeps you in a placeholder. Plus, uh, in the near future, if there is any change and we have immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, this is going to you know, already have your ticket to stand in line. So if something does change in the next year or two, uh, which is very possible that could happen, then you already are in that process and things, you know, would be um, you know, more readily available at if, you know, if you're, if you have everything filed. Yeah. Even so we have a couple of um, 
the questions on facebook page they are they are they are they are asking about this uh, current uh, the sandeep is asking do you think ab2 three dates could be current already you explained that we are waiting for the visibility and we might be it means as you said it means might be go to the filing maybe final date is going to be current but uh, we need to wait for the apply date right filling date correct so the the final action date is the one that actually provides the visa so um you know that will move you know quite a bit you know in the past uh this past fiscal year everything was pretty much stuck in 2009 for the first half so there should be a pretty good movement uh when we get the new bulletin uh but what what i was referring to a minute ago was we want to be prepared for any priority date to to have a be a current for the filing date so this is the uh, the other date similar to what happened in 2007 where everyone with an approved I140 but the visa still wasn't available were able to go ahead and file for EAD uh, and start that process so um, you know it like I said it's a little bit more of a security it, it allows more uh, planning on your, you and your family's part um, and uh, hopefully it, you know if there is comprehensive immigration reform if the all the democrats uh, win the elections that's pretty much probably pri- the first thing on the agenda. And if something changes in Congress and the president signs it into law, we want to be prepared so you can take advantage of that benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Lucas. The, actually, one more question in the Facebook, uh, the Rajesh Reddy. I think uh, you explained about this current, uh, current uh, dates. I think, uh, Rajesh, you got to information from Lucas. Lucas, we do have another question on Facebook page. Hey month. He's asking his wife for priority date is December 2010 in EB2 with her former employer and uh, his priority date is March 2011 in EB3. Let's say if his wife priority date become current, not uh, his October visa bulletin is possible to use our priority date file our 485 using inter filing process. So that's very can good you... point. So if you're listed as derivative, um, you can essentially port a date, but that's going to, you know, just like if you change employers, you're going to need to file a new I-140, and that's going to, you know, take some time. Um, so unfortunately, there's not much you could do to utilize that date unless, you know, maybe the, your wife went back to the former employer uh, and started working there. Then she could theoretically file as long as the, the job is the same or similar for whenever the I-140 was approved. Um, another caveat I wanted to bring up I didn't mention earlier, uh, under AC-21, uh, a person is able to port their uh, priority date you know, from one employer to another and, and maintain that, that date if the the job is the same or similar in function and nature. Um, likewise, if you have a pending adjustment of status application and it's been pending for six months or more, uh, any new employer you go to can just file a supplement J. There's no more requirements for PERMs. There's no more requirement for filing I-140. Once this is filed, you can go, it, it allows you more freedom to change employers in the future. It allows you to not, you know, maybe some employers would uh, not want to hire you or, or sponsor you because of the cost incurred. So this helps uh, allow you to become more mobile to change employers if you want to. Okay. Uh, Lucas, so we are getting uh, more questions on and Facebook page. This, this, another question is uh, Nisha, Aro, Nishant Harur. Aurora asking, do we need, even as we discuss about the I-944 and we discuss about the uh, tax and uh, assets, uh, assets and the question is, the bank balance is proof for the I-94 as a public charge rule? Is uh, USCS considered if any person bank balance is a public charge? Can you... These are all 
Yeah, you're correct. You're going to have to list is it you're, part of your assets is obviously going to be cash. Uh, so if you have one or two different bank accounts, a savings account, something like that, you're going to have to list the account. And you're going to have to list uh, the amount you know in the account is is part of your assets. Uh, likewise, you're going to have to list, you know, whatever mortgage or anything else, a car payment you have as far as a liability. So anything that you would consider an asset or liability, like if you file your taxes, it's going to be this more or less the same on this uh, public charge on the I-944 form. Okay. And one more question from Vijay K. Reddy. Uh, he's asking about the, if you get the current what is the timeline that one should file the 485 application? Is something like uh, it should fill in the same month, or what is if let's say is in visa bulletin in October? Let's say is a current, right? It means we can we should apply within the October month, or we can apply after maybe November or December. That's a good question. Um, you want to file. Uh, within the month uh, because the visa bulletin changes on a monthly basis. Dates can regress or progress uh, as they come. So <clears throat> what does this mean? Uh, if your priority date is let's say Jan 1 2010 for EB2 and the October bulletin says we can file uh, February 1 2010 well that means you have the opportunity to file your uh, adjustment of status application, but if in November so many people filed that the date regresses back to December 2009, then you've missed the opportunity and you're no, no longer able to file your adjustment of status. That's why I'm recommending, and I've spoken to hundreds and hundreds of people um, to be prepared. And you know, we've provided tools for people to, you know, kind of have a checklist ready, fill out a questionnaire. And that way, we're able to react quickly once the dates come out. And, and we have a list of everyone whose priority dates would be current or not. And then we can, you know, aggressively file the cases so we don't miss any time. Okay. Lucas, here one question uh, from Nishant uh, asking about um, the criminal record. And while applying the 485, should we submit the criminal, criminal record? Yes, 100%. So you're only required to, you know, um, disclose any criminal record, uh, like a, your background with the local authorities, if you've had any issue of being arrested or charged with a crime. Uh, you always want to disclose this information, uh, whether or not a case is dismissed, whether, you know, you, you, someone was charged and, you know, is proven not guilty in court, you still have to disclose this and provide the, the the requisite information. So if you have a uh, you know an order from the court showing that this is over or whatever it is, it, it doesn't mean it disqualifies you from a, a benefit. It just means we have to disclose it. Now, not disclosing any of these instances might lead to your case being denied, uh, and, and we don't want to go down that path. So I know maybe sometimes things happen. Uh, it could be a little embarrassing or whatnot, but it's very important to fully disclose any anything that happens uh, outside of a, like a minor traffic ticket. Okay. Uh, even uh, the traffic ticket also is a criminal record? Well, let's say uh, you were stopped and for whatever reason the, uh, the uh, policeman arrested you. Uh, we still have to disclose it. I have one client who... Um, was just happened to be driving through uh, Wisconsin and um, that he was stopped supposedly for some traffic violation and they arrested him out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> so I mean, you, even though he didn't do anything wrong and you know, he's probably at the wrong place at the wrong time uh, and there was nothing he could do about it. Um, we still have to disclose that. So there, anything as innocent as it is or, as serious as it is, we need to disclose always. Okay. So if, if let's say as a criminal record, how, how much time it will take, uh, how much time it will get um, the criminal record from the authorities? Do you, do you have any uh, rough days? Uh, or 
the, you can help to get the criminal records or everyone work individually to get the criminal record what is the we can definitely help yeah we can definitely help and we can you know reach out to whatever jurisdiction the the issue occurred in and help help that that process um most of the time you can easily get it within the same day uh, and, uh you know depending on where it is so like if you're in uh you know dallas it's much easier and faster to get the you know record maybe than if you're out in the country somewhere but yeah usually within a day or two we can get anything that's needed the most important thing is to have full disclosure so you know anything uh most people know this but i'll just re rephrase it i mean if when you hire an attorney or you talk to attorney everything is confidential so no matter how embarrassing or or how minimal you might think the issue might be. It's very important to always disclose these topics to attorney. So, you know, we don't have any pitfalls because it's, it's one thing, you know, to wait this long to get the GC and, and it would be, you know, if we miss one small detail, uh, you know, we don't want you to go to immigration court to be put in removal proceedings or to not eventually get the GC because of a non-disclosure on an application. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Lucas. The here it means uh, I have the another question on, on criminal record. Let's say I had uh, the criminal record two years ago. The current uh, maybe can I use the same record for apply the four eighty five adjustment now, or do we need to take the the recent criminal record and uh, submit to the four four eighty five application? So, good question. So, if you have an official file stamp copy of the criminal record, so like if you went to court, there was probation or the case was dismissed, any any uh, official document that with the file stamp copy will be more than more than uh, enough to to send with uh, the application. And again, that's something you'd want to maybe consult and discuss with attorney uh, to make sure we have the correct documentation. It's what's needed. Yeah, thank you, Nishant. Uh, I think uh, you you got the information from the Lucas. Maybe in this, uh, maybe any criminal record or maybe any criminal procedures proceedings. Maybe better to discuss with the attorneys and get more and uh, file four eighty five application before get clear and apply the four eighty five. Um, that is a good pr process. So I think uh, Nishant, uh, you got the more information about the criminal records. Um, uh, Lucas, uh, actually, we uh, we stopped. Uh, we still, we discussed uh, on this forms. If if we want to apply the four eighty five, what documents required? We already discussed, but just we need to give the more in details documents. Can you give the list of documents for? apply the 485 sure so obviously you want your uh um, passport with all the stamps uh, i-94 you're going to want you know current payroll records any current um, um h1b i nice i-797 copy approval showing that you're here uh in, in that status all, obviously you need your i-140 um if you're married, you need a marriage license or marriage certificate, birth certificate. Um, that's pretty in any criminal record that you might have. Uh, you're going to need to have six uh, passport style photos, which you can go to CVS or Walgreens. Uh, most people are familiar with when that if their spouse has age four EAD, uh, you know they go and get the uh, photos taken. Uh, and you know if you have a kid, you want the birth certificate. You want all these documents establishing, uh, you know, relationship, and then also that you're maintaining your uh, non-immigrant status before you file. Okay, so that's a uh, very the good information about the documentations. So here, one question: the medical examinations. All right. So still, we did not clear. I mean, so most of the. Already, my my friends who applied or who is going to be applied the 485, they said is first we need to take the medical examinations information attached to the 485 application while sending to the USCIS packet. What is the exactly 
on medical exa examination, do we need to take uh, before to submit or is there any chance to submit later, apply the 485? That's a good uh, question. Um, I've uh, obviously the medicals are only good for a limited amount of time. I think they're about a year, year and a half right now. So your case is probably not going to, uh, you know, be become to the point where it's required. So it's going to expire and you're going to have to get another medical done in the future. So I always recommend just, you know, wait until you go to interview or uh, the dates get closer, especially if we're talking about, again, going back to the visa bulletin, if you're able to file adjustment of status, uh, doesn't necessarily mean the visa is available. So there's really not any purpose to spend the two or three hundred dollars to get your medicals done if it's going to be maybe a few years before you get your GC in hand. So I always recommend just wait and, um, you know, you can always take that with you to the uh, 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 interview at the USCIS uh, office. Okay. So let's say is uh, the while applying the 485 in a family, the spouse and uh, the husband and wife and kid, let's say the kid born here, you know, just stayed. So we sh do we need to submit any documentation uh, the kids about the kid or only the primary applicant and uh, dependent other national nationalists? So that's a good question. Um, what you always want to do, on, even on the application itself, you're going to have to list the uh, all your kids, your parents, um, your spouse, how many times you've been married, et cetera, et cetera. So even if the kid's born here, you still need to list and include. Now, that doesn't mean you need to file anything, obviously, because the kid is a U.S. citizen, so therefore there's no requirement to file anything. Um, but, um, yeah, you would need to... There, there's places all in the forms to list these f uh, family relationships, and we want to make sure we document that correctly. Okay. Uh, Lucas, yeah, I think pretty much we discussed about uh, the 485 adjustment status and uh, forms and uh, documentation and fees. So let's say I have a one question about the H1 primary applicant uh, had I-140 with the previous employer. Now he moved to the another employer but they are in process to apply the I-140. Let's say today, maybe the October visa bulletin will get the current. That, that primary applicant will apply the 485 adjustment status or what is the scenario here? Can you give the more information on that one? So, yes, that's a good question. So a lot of people, um, have I-140, obviously, going back 10 years now. If the date becomes current or so, there's an opportunity to file, um, if you're still, you know, you can go back to your previous employer if the I-140 was never withdrawn. Um, uh, and you could, as long as you have the same or similar job, you could then file uh, with that employer. Or you could, um, you know, wait for the I-140 to be ported over with your new employer. And again, what I'm trying to reference here is that there was provisions put into the law uh, in the regulations under, for, under AC21 that make it easier for, for foreign nationals to change companies, to not be uh, handcuffed to one employer for so long. And, you know, a lot of employers I work with are really good employers. They care about the employees. They do things to take care of uh, people, if, you know. And it's like a family relationship where people are together for many, many years. There's other employers that take advantage of, um, you know, their employees that, it, you know, it might be very difficult to work for them. And the employee can't feel free to leave because they have I-140, right? So the law is set up that if you have an adjustment of status pending for more than six months, which would be 181 days, 
any future employer you have, you don't have to file a new I-140. You don't have to go through that process again with the perm or porting over. You can just uh, port over your actual pending adjustment to a new employer. So that's why I'm encouraging people. It's not so much the final action date with the green card to get green card in hand, but if you file, if you're able to file the adjustment of status, even if the it's going to be a year or two or three or four, four, however many years before you get green card in hand, it allows you to have the maneuverability to do what you need to take care of your family or whatever might happen if you need to change employers. Uh, it, it, it just, it helps out a tremendous deal. Okay. Maybe in this scenario, maybe better to uh, discuss with the attorneys and uh, take on the steps after that one. So there's a there's a case by case I think in this scenario. So better right. to have conversation with the attorneys. So it means they will guide the right direction to proceed to apply the 485 adjustment status. So yes, Lucas, it means today we pretty much discuss about the 485 adjustment status, uh, and uh, we hope. Uh, we, it, it, it will get the visa, October visa written next uh, couple of days and maybe by the end of the week. So we keep saying to everyone, be ready with your information. Uh, you can talk to your attorneys and uh, get ready for apply the 485. So uh, as uh, Lucas is saying that uh, if once dates are coming, all attorneys are very busy to validate the documentations. So better to have uh, validation before maybe next couple of days or you can send your document to the attorneys and do validation so that uh, they can give they can validate and uh, will ask the appropriate documentations and uh, re relevant documentation so that uh, 485 will not be rejected or any RFEs RFEs uh, Lucas do you want to share any additional on this topic or maybe you can give your mm, suggestion if any suggestion to the larger audience yeah i'll just go ahead and uh go over again the fees i don't think we really discussed uh the major changes so again october 2nd uh the new fees are scheduled to uh, uh be in effect and we want to make sure twofold that you have the current form so you can always go to uscis.gov and you can find the most recent version of any form. So don't rely on any uh, uh, PDF or a form that's shared by anyone. Make sure if you do it yourself, by all means, go to USCIS.gov and find the correct form with the, and they'll, they'll tell you the current forms that are being accepted. And the filing fees in the past, like I was saying for adjustment was uh, 1,225, uh, which included the I-131, 45, 765. With biometrics now, those fees, and I'll just kind of go down the list. The forty-five is one thousand one hundred and thirty. I one thirty-one is five hundred and ninety. The seven sixty-five is five hundred and fifty. The biometrics is thirty. So it's it's a little bit more, and uh, you know we want to make sure everyone's budgeted to uh, have all the filing fees. Um, another thing I recommend is uh, instead of worrying about you know, you can pay with credit card, you can pay with check um, or money order. I always recommend when we have cases like this that if you, if you can uh, purchase money orders. Uh, and the, the reason is, um, and go to U.S. Postal Service, the post office, to buy money orders because the money orders, um, if you buy from Western Union or some other place, are only valid for like three months. So let's say something happens, your case is processed with thousands of other cases and it falls in the cracks and they find it, well, they'll reject your case because now the money orders are no longer valid. So we want to make sure we do everything possible to make sure that the case, whatever there is, if there's a delay, that there's no possible reason for rejection. Okay. So, yeah, thank you, Lucas, and uh, we got the couple of questions on Facebook. Uh, Naveen, Naveen we are, it means already Lucas explained about the current date. Uh, we are anticipating maybe uh, much dates, but not short now. We are waiting for October visa bulletin. 
mostly by 250,000, mostly until 2012, maybe we can get sure, I'm not sure, but uh, 2012, but uh, we are ant anticipating more and more dates. And uh, Vijay, uh, I think, yes, Vijay, we need to submit the I-693 and uh, along with the I-485, we need to submit the medical documentation along with the 485. Uh, the one question, uh, Lucas, this one is uh, I about to ask, but uh, the Nishant uh, asked, do we need any documentation from the employer? This 485 is uh, pure related to the employee, not employer. So is any document required from the employer for the apply the 485? No. So you need to have the I-140 to apply, you know, obviously for the 485. Um, you, now, keep in mind, you will end up going to uh, an interview. Uh, and now at the interview, there, you know, that issue is going to come up. You know, are you working for this person? What are your job duties, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you do need to be prepared and not, you know, don't cut any corners. Don't file an adjustment if you're not currently working uh, for that employer, uh, because if you can't support that in the future, you don't want to wait all these years and then have something denied uh, because of that. And then that's another issue to bring up. Um, you also want to, if you're able to file, you want to maintain your non-immigrant status as much as possible, because if something does come up in the future for your adjustment to be denied, at least you would still be in status with your uh, current status, like if it's H1 or whatnot. No. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Lucas. Thank you very much for uh, uh, having today's session. Just I'm um, um, summarizing today's uh, today uh, webinar. Uh, everyone know it means uh, fast couple of weeks. We are discussing about the about the good number of uh, the green card going to be add. They so that we are anticipating maybe more years. So that is very good news for long waiting green cards. So be ready with your documentation and uh, forms. You can talk to the, your attorneys and uh, maybe if you have any questions, reach out to the Lucas. So Lucas will give the events, give the more information. So uh, you can you can you can reach out uh, on phone or email two one four seven seven four four seven one three or email info at the rate uh, b g i m m l a w dot com. So be ready uh, with your documentation. Mostly, Edmunds Lucas, I forgot to ask Edmunds. Uh, uh, the one documentation is uh, the birth certificate. Let's say uh, the who born before uh, 80s or maybe before 85s. So we don't in India. We don't have the the proper system to give the birth certificate. But some cases, if it doesn't have the birth certificate, what is the alternative documentation for? the birth certificate good question so this comes up quite a bit um you can get uh two affidavits who were around at the time of your birth the you know and you can have those either uh completed in india or here in the states depending on where they're located and you can also use your provisionals so your provisionals are going to also list everything uh with your name your parents name uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and so those documents, along with, uh, you know, not being able to obtain a birth certificate, um, is sufficient. Um, I've had a few people in the past, their, their village is close to the bifurcated area of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. And, you know, the record just doesn't exist anymore. So, you know, a couple of affidavits are fine and, and, uh, your provisionals, obviously. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think you know the um, all uh, Telangana AP original yeah. <laughs> <laughs> joke. <laughs> I try. Yeah, thank you. Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. So yeah, as we are saying that it must be ready with uh, your documentations and uh, uh, be prepared. Maybe very soon it means October visa bulletin will going to be released. Uh, we don't know, but we are anticipating to the more. It, it it moved to the the more than one or two years, so so be ready. So 
we will continue the this platform every Wednesday, uh, 6 p.m. Central Time. Maybe you can utilize this platform and uh, get more information from the attorney Lucas. We are ready to help to you. And uh, if, if you reach out to the Lucas for free, free consultation. So our primary is to help to community. Uh, so that's we brought up this uh, uh, platform. Uh, thank you very much, Lucas, to helping to us uh, on this uh, in platform. So most welcome and everyone. Uh, one more comment. Uh, make sure you like and follow us on Facebook. Uh, that way, you know, with Telugu NRA radio or my uh, law firm page, um, BGIMM on Facebook, uh, we'll have all up to date notifications as the bulletins uh, released. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So today we are ending the short now and uh, we will catch up the next Wednesday 6 p.m. Central Time. You can uh, tune till we are on Facebook and uh, uh, Bulgos and uh, Garistan Facebook, uh, Facebook. So you can get the more information about the U.S. immigration and you can track uh, 485 and the visa bulletin, October visa bulletin uh, uh, changes. So we are ending now. Thank you. Thank you very much for your your question on Facebook. You can post your question on Facebook. We are ready to help to you. Thank you very much, Vijay, Nishant, and uh, Naveen. So, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lucas. Most welcome. We'll talk to you next week. Yeah, thank you. Bye.